I'm happy to say it. Y'all proved me wrong. I didn't think y'all would enjoy the data structures video. That's kind of why I stopped after four data structures instead of doing the full seven. Because I'm like, no one's going to watch this. Whenever I get down into the weeds, maybe it gets like half the amount of views that another video would get. I kind of addressed this in the beginning of that video. That's why I stopped. But y'all seem to like it. So we're going to go over those final three data structures that I was going to address earlier and maybe throw in a fourth one. I'm not sure. Y'all will know before me. You can just look at the scrub bar and, and roll on through. But I figure we'll get started that way. Good way to start the week. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the video. I hope you had a nice and safe Halloween weekend. I had a couple people over and we lit a fire. So as a follow up to the four data structures you need to know, the three more data structures you need to know are hash tables, trees, graphs. Let's start off with hash tables. So a hash table is a data structure that stores values with keys associated with each of them. You can kind of think of a database. So this really helps when you're trying to find a particular value because it has a key linked up to it. So I know I normally go over the applications of particular data structures at the end of the list, like in that previous video, not to mess that up. I'm gonna switch up the order of things real quick, just so you can get a better understanding before we really kind of get into the weeds of hash tables. Think of you being a student. As a student, you have your name, you have your email, you have your courses that semester, so on and so forth. But then you also have a student ID. Think of that student ID as the key to access all of those other values, like your name and your email and your classes and your grades. So when it comes to hash tables, it is very efficient when it comes to inserting and searching because you can just look at that student ID in order to get all of that student's information. And we use hash tables to avoid direct addressing. So whereas hash tables, you have the student ID, you, you have the key, I'm gonna go back to that. You have the key and you have multiple values attached to that key. When it comes to direct addressing, you have one key for each value. So you can see how when you have a whole entire database, if it was just direct addressing and it is really long, well, it can get very inefficient. To avoid the issue that comes with direct addressing, we use hash tables. And in particular, we use the hash function. So we use the hash function to map a data set of whatever size to a fixed size. This falls into the hash table. And the values returned by hash function, you may have guessed it, hash values. There are also other names like hash codes and or simply just hashes or hash sum. But I, I just call them hash values. Now, mind you, you can have good hash functions and bad hash functions. Some hash functions, you may run into something that is called a collision. Well, depending on the collision, you can use something called chaining or open addressing. So when it comes to chaining, think of the hash table as an array of linked lists, where each index has its own linked list. So all key value pairs pointing to the same index will be stored in that index, in, index indices linked list. Let me try that again. All key value pairs mapping to the same index will be stored in the linked list of that index. That was a much better sentence. And the benefits of chaining is that whenever it comes to an insertion, you always use 01. And as long as you have enough space, you, it, in theory, it can be as big as you need it to be and, and you'll never need to resize it. And with open addressing, I mean, it solves the same problem of collisions as does chaining. However, it just depends on exactly what you need. So when it comes to open addressing, Whereas chaining, it can grow, you, you never need to resize it. It can grow as big as it wants. With this, it, you, you determine how big it is. And as long as it's greater than or equal to the amount of elements that are in your hash table, you're good. Otherwise, you need to resize it, make it bigger because it can become full. It also requires more computation, this and that, but it, it has better cache performance. So that's a plus. It also doesn't waste as much space as chaining because it one, it doesn't use links and slots can be used even if an input doesn't map to it. So there, there are benefits to either one, but uh, I think I commented in the last video, hash tables are kind of heavy. And when I say that, like you can just go down a rabbit hole into all these different aspects. So other than that, applications are like databases, like I previously mentioned. They're used to implement associative arrays and they're used to implement the set data structure. But trees, think of the data structure tree as you would a family tree. It's a high, higher, this is going to be a difficult word to say, high, hmm. hierarchically. Hierarchically. Data is organized hierarchically and are linked together. However, it's different than a linked list because a linked list is linear and a tree obviously is the word I just said. There are a lot of different types of trees that have been created over the past years to, to really fit a particular problem. Certain applications have certain restraints, which requires a certain tree. So there's binary search tree, 
speed tree, treep, red black tree, splay tree, AVL tree, and innery tree. Let's just focus on the binary search tree. How about that? So just as the name suggests, a binary search tree is a binary tree and data is organized in a hierarchi hierarchical structure. And this data structure stores values in sorted order. And of course, in a binary tree, there are a bunch of nodes and each node has four particular attributes. You have key, left, right, P. So key, that is the value stored in the node. Left is the pointer to the left child. Right is the pointer to the right child. And P is the pointer to the parent. So what makes a binary search tree special is a particular property, cleverly coined binary search tree property. This property defines that every node on the right subtree needs to be larger than the current node, while every node on the left subtree needs to be smaller than the current node. So if you've ever taken a test and you're asked, what kind of tree is this? Just look for the BST property, the, the binary search tree property. If everything on the right is bigger than above and everything on the left is smaller than above, that that's a binary search tree. So what are some applications for different trees? Well, to start off with a binary search tree, well, a binary search tree is used when data is constantly entering and leaving. So if you use a particular language's library, you may be familiar with the map and set object. Well, those use binary search trees. Or maybe a more practical example, let me see if I can explain this well. Say you have something, say you sell something, like for me, it's a bag of coffee. Say the cost of that coffee is $12. Let's say that's the top of our binary search tree and everything down to the right of that will be however many items sells above the price of $12. So if it sells for $14 or $17, well, that'll just fall down to the right subtree. And now you know the number of items purchased at a higher cost than the given cost. And then you use binary trees for like expression, parsers, and solvers. Heaps are actually used by JVM to store objects. And then treeps, they're used in wireless networking. Now let's talk about graphs. So by definition, a graph is a finite set of vertices and a finite set of edges connecting those vertices. And by vertices, I mean nodes, but when it comes to graphs, you call them vertices, same thing. And it can get a little confusing when you talk about the order and the size of the graph, but just think of it this way. The order of the graph are the amount of vertices in the graph, and the size of a graph is the number of edges in a graph. There are directed graphs and there are undirected graphs. Let's talk about the directed graphs first. So a directed graph is exactly what you may think it is, is that when it comes to the edges, there's an actual direction to the edges, and that is how you define a directed graph. Whereas undirected graph, they're just connected by edges, but there's no particular direction. And then in directed graphs, there are self loops, which is exactly what it sounds like. Think of an edge that points from one node to the same node. And then I do wanna point out when it comes to undirected graphs, when it comes to the edges, while they don't have a particular direction, that means they can go either way. And with undirected graphs, you're able to have isolated vertices or isolated nodes. So there's no edges connecting that to any other node. The absolute best application of edges and the best way for you to visualize it is a social network. Your vertice or a node, and when you connect with me, that creates an edge between us. You connect to them, that creates an edge between you. And also an application of a graph is GPS. So in a GPS, you have two different locations or multiple, and then you have the route connecting it and those act as your vertices and your edges. All right, cool. I think we completed this video. I hope y'all like this one just as much as you liked the last one. I know I was considering adding in like an extra data structure at the end. We just went over three. However, we kind of touched on the extra that I was going to go over, which was another binary or another tree. So yeah, I'm happy with what we discussed today. If you feel the same way, I'd appreciate if you gave it a thumbs up, not for my own vanity, but because it helps the YouTube algorithm and consider subscribing. I would like to make more in-depth videos like this if y'all continue to respond well to it because these videos have a little bit more work put into them than me discussing things that I learn on the job, kind of ideologies when it comes to software engineering because those are just those are just kind of realizations whereas this, this is something that you actually have to study and learn and understand to actually talk about and teach. I like doing it. I just want to make sure that my time is allocated properly and if y'all like this let me know in the comment section let me know let me know by sharing it with friends because the views are really what talk and while you're down in the comment section saying how much more you want these more in the weeds types videos i want to ask just out of curiosity how many people like the outdoors show of hands do you like hiking or boating or fishing or hunting or whatever anything outdoors i'm i love that type of stuff and i want to know if do I have any other people who were like me who love to sit inside and code 
but also love to get outside and just do a bunch of fun outdoor activities, let me know. I'm curious. See you on the next video if you subscribe. If not, then it was good to see you for these past 10, 15 minutes.